Hello, welcome to lecture eight of deep unsupervised learning. Today, we are going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of various generative models and representational learning methods that we've seen so far. So, the brain has 10 to the power of 14 synapses, and we only live for 10 to the power of nine seconds. And so we have a lot more parameters than the, number, the data we ingest. So this motivates that we should do a lot of unsupervised learning because in order to provide sufficient fodder for the number of parameters that we have in our brain, we should be able to predict a lot more bits in the data that we ingest, which is uh, 10 to the power of five order of magnitude smaller, right? So this was a statement made by uh, Jeff Hinton in his uh, 2014 AMA Reddit. So firstly, the summary of the course so far, we've looked at all regressive models, pixel RNN, pixel CNN, uh, pixel CNN++, pixel snail. Uh, we looked at flow models, uh, real MVP family of models, and also the connections between autoregressive flows and inverse autoregressive flows. Uh, next, we covered latent variable models, models with approximate uh, density estimates using the variational lower bound and uh, various instantiations of that, like the VAE, impotence weighted autoencoder, VQVAE, pixel VAE, and so forth. Uh, and we also then jumped into a different class of generative models that don't work with the likelihood principle the implicit density models against energy-based models and the moment matching principle. And finally, we question the idea of like whether we even need to learn generative models if all we care about is extracting useful features from unlabeled data. And that got us into this topic called self-supervised representation. Uh, and we saw that with the right kind of simple cognitive principles uh, and a lot of data and compute, we can learn really useful representations of unlabeled images uh, that are competitive with supervised representations. So, represent, so let's let's look at autoregressive models. Uh, in the in 2015, the main paper was published, which 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 introduced this idea of masked autoencoder for density estimation, and it was able to produce these MNIST digits, which were reasonable looking but very jittery. Uh, and this idea was extended to much stronger, more expressive architectures well suited for image modeling, like mass convolutions, which was introduced in the pixel RNN or pixel CNN family of models. And uh, you suddenly started seeing generative models working for uh, high dimensional and uh, much more diverse data sets like ImageNet. So these are samples from ImageNet 64 by 64. You can see that the, the structure across 4,000 pixels is pretty coherent, but the color is not that good, and therefore you're not actually able to identify any visible class from ImageNet. But this was a big, big jump from the quality you saw and made. And this idea of mass convolutions has also been applied for one-dimensional data like audio. And um, in order to model long-range coherent audio samples, uh, the idea of using dilated convolutions was introduced. And uh, this was also applied for the text-to-speech system where you're gonna convert linguistic and text features to raw audio. And that can be used in any uh, assist, uh, intelligent assistant like the Google Assistant. And this was the wavelength architecture that was uh, commercially deployed after, after a year or two. And the same idea of using mass convolutions with autoregressive pixel level modeling has also been applied for video prediction, where you're looking at the past frames and encoding them with a convolutional LSTM. And then you're uh, taking the uh, embedded representation as a conditioning information for a pixel CNN decoder that generates the next frame pixel by pixel. And it's able to produce a coherent uh, video of like a robot moving objects around. So over time, the autoregressive modeling community has expanded further and further in terms of the level of engineering and architectural innovation. And on the left, you can see the subscale pixel networks, which have very coherent samples because of the clever conditioning mechanisms they use. And on the right, you see 
hierarchical autoregressive image models with auxiliary decoders for the idea of using latent space autoregressive models was introduced by quantizing representations of autoencoders and then modeling the pixel CNN in the latent space, uh, which is also similar to the VQVAE idea that you've seen in the, in, in the VAE lecture. So apart from images and audio and video, autoregressive models have had immense success in language. And these are samples from GPT-2, uh, where it's able to actually produce a coherent story about unicorns uh, and, and like, a, like a story of how unicorns can invent their own language. And um, also talks about a scientist who's able to uh, observe all this phenomenon. And um, this shows that uh, language modeling at the level of a paragraph or even multiple paragraphs is possible by just training large models, which used to autoregressive structures. Um, this slide shows the evolution of language models over time. Uh, where you, on the first you see Shannon's three gram models, which are reasonably good, but not super coherent across the full sentence. Uh, and then Ilya Sutskiver's model of uh, using an RNN uh, is able to produce a couple of sentences, but not completely uh, making sense. And then over time, by using bigger LSTMs, bigger transformers, you ended up with the quality that GPT-2 exhibits right now. So all these huge advances have been possible due to multiple reasons. And let's go through them quickly. Uh, the first thing is just being able to train with larger batch sizes because of more compute availability. And training with larger batch sizes certainly stabilizes the training of these models and optimizes these losses much better, uh, making the models wider, making the models deeper, uh, figuring out clever ways to condition your, uh, let's say you're, you're building a conditional, class conditional or audio condition or text condition model. Uh, the figuring out ways to gate the conditioning information cleverly is very useful. Pre-processing, uh, like in WaveNet, we use the MULA pre-processing to quantize uh, continuous audio into discrete entities. Or, uh, for, for example, in pixels, uh, you're actually using categorical information for modeling rather than, um, uh, figure, like, rather than using Gaussians. So these are, these are all, and, and, and in language, you're using byte parent coding, which is pre-trained on a huge corpus, and therefore you're, mo you're not modeling neither at the character level or at the word level, but you're modeling at the sub-word level, and that's much more useful for generalization um, and also building more efficient models. Uh, compute power, uh, and as we progress in the last two three years, we just have we just have access to a lot more compute, uh, like TPUs or like big GPU rigs, which have lots of GPUs connected really with a really fast interconnect, and therefore we're able to train data 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 parallel models much better, uh, and we're also able to see that several weeks or days of training are usually producing much better results. Uh, and also making fewer assumptions about the whole problem. Like uh, before trying the idea of just predicting categorical distributions for every pixel, uh, why would you wanna uh, imagine that pixels are definitely gonna be modeled with Gaussians instead of uh, categorical distributions? Uh, like intuitively it doesn't make any sense, but then, uh, Practically, it's better for a neural network to work with cross entropy losses. Uh, there have also been architectural advances that made all these results much better. So, mass convolutions were applied in the original piece of CNN, but as transformers and dilated convolutions started to exist, the samples just got much better with more coherent structure across long range dependencies. Uh, and, and, and making the whole modeling problem look more like supervised learning helps a lot, and therefore, Relying, relying heavily on a well-behaved cross entropy loss and optimizers that have been much better tuned for this loss ensures that uh, generative modeling can also benefit from all this adv uh, engineering advancements. Uh, so now what's the future for autoregressive models? Uh, we're only scratching the surface of what's possible. Uh, and, and once we have model parallel training uh, we, we'll be able to uh, realize a lot more. For instance, we'll be able to train trillion parameter models on all of the internet's text, and that, that way we could compress all the internet's text into 
a giant neural network that can behave like a know-it-all language model. And secondly, we can um, figure out ways to train one single model for multiple modalities, just an even bigger generative model that could work at a video level on YouTube or image level on Instagram, text level on Wikipedia. Uh, so that way it's, it's able to probably correlate information across multiple entities in a completely unsupervised fashion. So for all these kind of modeling uh, requires hardware and software advances for model parallel training. Uh, we should all, it's also possible to make autoregressive models more useful by figuring out faster ways to sample with better uh, lower level primitives at the CUDA level, uh, like for instance, sparse kernels uh, and, and, and better, uh, like, like for example, wave RNN uses all these mechanisms for production and, 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 it's, and doesn't need to be distilled into something like a parallel wave net. It can just work as a standalone autoregressive model and still be deployed on an Android phone. Uh, hybrid models with much weaker autoregressive structure, but that can be trained on a larger scale could be revisited. Uh, and, and of course, all these architectural innovations that help in long range dependencies would always help in, you know, as you keep moving to bigger images or video or something like that, uh, the, the, these kind of ideas should help a lot. So, uh, like like a summary of autoregressive model could be that it is an active topic with a lot of cutting edge results and there's a lot more scope for new engineering and creative architecture design and uh, larger models and data sets are clearly needed to you know uh, realize the full potential of these class of models and uh, stand alone they're very successful across all modalities without any conditioning information like class labels. So that's that's like a very appealing property of these models. They're very universal in that sense. Um, and also they, they can work without much engineering for sampling time. So that makes them very lucrative. Uh, but 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 nevertheless for production, uh, if you, you you should really cut down on the sampling time to be useful. And um, so innovating on the low level primitives is very important there. So that said, uh, there are a lot of negatives for autoregressive modeling. One is you don't extract any representation. There is no bottleneck structure and sampling time is not good for deployment. It's not particularly usable for downstream tasks. Um, like for instance, a language model, you need to sample multiple times to see coherent samples. So you can just roll out a language model as a software and uh, there are no interpolations that you can see to visualize what the model is actually learning. And uh, every time you sample, it's gonna take a long time and you have to produce like a diverse set of samples. So that's it about autoregressive models. Now let's look at flow models. Uh, in flow models, uh, it, it all started with a nice architecture by uh, Lo and Din. Uh, and uh, those, the model was already producing very good digits on the MNIST dataset. And on the TFT data set, it was producing reasonable faces, but it really was bad on CFAR and SVHN data set. The samples were very blurry, but it all improved with a real MVP architecture, which introduced other kinds of flows and batch norm to make the models better. Uh, and then uh, the GLOW model from uh, King model was published where uh, the real MVP model was taken to another level by making it produce much larger images. Uh, and uh, so a work done in our, our lab called Flow++ Plus Plus, uh, advanced the uh, likelihood scores for flow-based models to uh, competitive scores that with that of autoregressive models for the first time. Uh, and uh, this was done by just architecture engineering and scale. So this shows the power of flow models, the potential they have in terms of closing the gap in density estimation between autoregressive models without having the powerful uh, autoregressive structure but at the same time being really fast with sampling and also potentially useful for inference. So given all these progresses, there's a lot of future work left in terms of how to learn the mask, how do you actually completely close the gap with autoregressive models, uh, whether you wanna use very expressive flows but very few, or whether you wanna use uh, shallow flows which are not particularly expressive, but then, keep on stacking them so that you can get a very expressive uh, composed model. 
um, how do you use multi-scale losses for, and how do you trade off between your density estimates and your sample quality, and how to uh, use the representations you derive at various levels of the flow model for downstream tasks. All these are like fundamental advances to think about for flow models, and also how do how do you carefully initialize so that flow models can train very fast. So, in terms of core achievements that you can aim for, uh, you can aim for producing glow-level samples, which are with, with, with flow models that have way fewer parameters. You know, like glow uses half a billion parameters for all the celebrity faces, and that's unlikely to scale well. And uh, how do you make it work potentially for even larger images? How do you work, do dimensionality reduction with flows? And uh, think about other other flow models like conditional flow models and uh, you know how, how do you actually close the gap in the sample quality to GANs and also close the likelihood scores gap between autoregressive models. It's, so flow models put, provide the pathway to do both, and it's 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 it, it's interesting to think about how to do all these things together. So the negative of flow models is you expect to have the same dimension at every layer, every stack of the flow. And so it's unlikely to scale if your data is getting bigger and higher dimensional. And unless you innovate on how to do dimensional reduction with flows, it's unlikely to be useful. And you really need to carefully initialize and use things like act norm for good numbers. So that's, that's another negative because it may not be directly usable for another modality or another data set or another kind of architecture. Um, so next, let's look at latent variable models. Uh, we'll see the various different VAE strengths and weaknesses and uh, what, what have been some visible successes in VAEs. Uh, it all started with the original MNIST uh, modeling by Dirk Kingma, where you could see various types of digits and strokes and the slopes of the strokes and shades uh, across multiple digits. And then it got extended to much better, more powerful data sets like Elson bedrooms by Pixel VAE, and also ImageNet 64 by 64, producing much better global globally more coherent samples than Pixel CNN because of modeling the latent structure. Uh, and then there's the latent variable models uh, innovation in terms of using hierarchical models and multi-stack, using hierarchical latent inference and producing really high quality celebrity phases on par with flow models. So there are well-known applications of VAE, like sketch RNA and world models and beta VAE, which is used for modeling visual concepts. Uh, and there are applications like DeepMind's generative query networks, which does view synthesis of a separate view uh, by taking in two provided views, Im embedding into a latent variable, and then uh, interpolating that latent space for a query view across across multiple possibilities. And therefore, you, you can just collect data in a completely new environment uh, from first-person vision. Uh, you, can, you can keep a track of what your pose is when you're recording things. And then, uh, you, in principle, you could figure out how a particular scene looks like from any other viewpoint and therefore reconstruct the entire room or entire in, in environment completely uh, through this kind of a synthesis model that has variational inference. So VAEs have practical use in these kind of architectures. Uh, and there are lots of advantages of VAEs. You get a compressed bottleneck representation. You can get approximate density estimates and you can interpolate and visualize what the model learns. You can potentially get disentangled representations where different latents correspond to different aspects of the data. And it is like a model that allows you to do all these things together at once. Like you, you, you basically can sample, so you have a generative model, you have a density estimate, so you can use for auto distribution detection as a density model. You have latent variables, so you, you do representation learning, and you also have a bottleneck representation, so you're able to reduce the dimensionality of your original data set. So a VAE is the only model that lets you do all these four things together, and that makes it very appealing. That said, there are disadvantages. You often end up with blurry samples, and assumption of a factorized Gaussian for the posterior or for the decoder is maybe very limiting, and you need more powerful decoders and more powerful posteriors. Uh, 
and large scale successes are still yet to be shown. And even though people have tried to like get more interpretable, more disentangled latent variables by prioritizing the KL term over the reconstruction term, the loss, uh, it still only worked on toy problems. And there may actually be better ways to do representation learning or generation or like uh, yeah, interpolation in some form, uh, hierarchical latents indiv individually. So expecting for one model to do all of them well may be truly hard. And so a VA may not be the state of the art model on anything, but maybe a model that lets you do all, all, the, all these things reasonably well in, at, uh, using a single, sing, single modeling uh, framework. So uh, that's, that, that, that's, the, that's what you lose when, when you want just everything within a one model. So that, these are the disadvantages of VAE, but there's obviously scope for future work. You can, but you can use bigger decoders, um, more powerful posteriors. You can think about how to do hierarchical latents uh, to learn cores and fine-grained features, and discrete latents like VQVAE, and also uh, large-scale training like flow models have been done, like GLOW or Flow Plus Plus. So. Next, let's cover implicit models, but uh, we, we look at generative adversarial networks and just, just basically what, what's happened in GANs, though we also covered moment matching in our energy-based models in class. Uh, the GAN samples, the quality of GAN samples has dramatically advanced uh, from the primitive samples that you saw in um, the original GAN, uh, where you saw like reasonably looking at faces, but then uh, the C4 samples, it's, it's not particularly interpretable in terms of what is the object or class of C4 that's been captured, but it certainly looked different from blurry VAE samples of the time. Uh, next, you saw DC GAN, which clearly advanced some, the sample quality of GANs to a state where um, GANs were so, certainly very, looking much, much more exciting than any other model because the samples were much sharper. Uh, and, and all these bedrooms were very high dimensional. And then um, recently, the GAN, GAN has been taken over by big GAN and style GAN uh, class of models, where clearly careful attention to detail in terms of architecture design and also really, really large scale training, like large path sizes and a lot of stabilization tricks can produce these amazing photorealistic samples that you've already seen plenty of times in the class. Um, so I'm not going to go over them. Uh, in terms of future work for GANs, I think I think it's really hard to bet against GANs to say, hey, this is what GAN is weak in. Uh, it's most likely that if you put sufficient effort in engineering, you can get a GAN to function function well on those things as well. But but nevertheless, uh, there's still more progress to be made in unconditional GANs, mode collapse, uh, and also more complex scenes and video generation would be cool. For instance, it would be nice to get a model that works on uh, real driving data where, and where a lot of pedestrians are walking and then you want to be able to simulate the future. Uh, you have to keep track of multiple people, multiple objects, multiple cars, uh, road signs, and so forth. So it's a very complicated uh, generative modeling problem and it would be interesting to see if GANs, which are known to identify only a few cues in your data set, would they still work in such complex settings where you need to keep track of multiple things at once. Uh, so future work in terms of modeling, you can uh, like think of more approaches for lipschitzness, better conditioning tricks, like how to feed noise at various levels, like for instance, StyleGAN basically innovated there, uh, batch or instance normalization, uh, how to design better architectures, what kind of upsampling and downsampling ops to use, how to, how to do channel upsampling and downsampling without introducing a lot of parameters, what is the right objective function for your discriminator, and how to uh, scale and train GANs in a stable manner for like larger problems, and how to perturb it at various different levels, like how to add instance noise or feature noise so that you can stabilize the training of the discriminator much better. So all those things are very, very interesting and think about. Uh, in terms of negatives against GANs, one could say there's plenty of engineering details, 
and it's hard to clearly identify which is the most important core component that helps you to produce these high quality images. And it's also very time consuming to ablate for these details. So, uh, it, and, 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 and it's very clear we need to improve on the sample diversity, but then we also don't have very good metrics for evaluation. So we need to work with what we have. And even though it may seem like we're improving a lot on the current metrics we use for GAN evaluations, uh, objectively, the sample diversity is not as good as likelihood-based models. So uh, how do we actually come up with better evaluation measures is also one thing to think about. But all these aspects, like good evaluations, good metrics, ablations, these are not particularly specific to this GAN. So this can, these can be set for any, any, any kind of model as well, any other model. So uh, if you were to uh, make a choice between GAN or density model, uh, one would imagine you need a lot of engineering details for GANs, but it's not particularly true. Uh, even for density models, uh, the architectural engineering has been a comparable level of detail and you know trickery that you need for GANs. And uh, secondly, there is a lot of attempt at theoretically understanding GANs. Uh, so the trade-off between having blurry samples uh, versus being okay with mode collapse is basically the same trade-off that you make when you care more about compression at the cost of sample quality versus you wanting to have really good samples at the cost of missing some modes. So it's basically which direction of KL that you care about and the reverse direction you care about more if you don't want any spurious sample, but the forward direction you care about more if you really want to make sure that your modeling is good and you, you're not going to make any mistakes, even though you're, you're not going to miss out anything, even though you're, you may make some mistakes at some of, some of the points. So mostly, uh, apart from the fact that they can produce amazing samples, CANs are popular because they can work with much less compute. Uh, for instance, in order to generate a one megapixel image uh, for an autoregressive model or even a latent space autoregressive model, you need to use at least 512 cores of TPU to do that uh, because you need such large batch sizes. Whereas for GANs, you can make it work with a single V100 GPU. Uh, and then, uh, so, the, so that's, that's one reason why GANs are clearly preferred over den density models because the amount of time taken to train as well as sample and you, you can also see better interpolations and better conditional generation in GANs. So this, this leads to adoption by people who are more interested in art and fine tuning to like interesting artistic data sets which are not particularly machine learning relevant. And that's, that's one, one of the other reasons why GAN has picked up a lot. So on the bright side, we can think about uh, how like many technological advances have been possible without the correct science. And so GANs can be considered in that way as well. And uh, this is a slide from uh, Jan LeCun on the epistemology of deep learning, where he explains that several technologies in the past have preceded their science that explains them. For example, the steam engine was before the thermodynamics. So uh, it's doing better theory for GANs is something that could still be innovated on in the future. So here's the taxonomy of generative models uh, from Ian Goodfellow's Neurips tutorial. Uh, apart from Markov chain, Boltzmann machines, and um, Markov chain generative stochastic networks, we have pretty much covered everything else. Uh, we've covered NAID, MADE, Pixel RNN, um, how to use change of variables, which gave the flow models or real MVP models. All of these are explicit density models. And then we also covered approximate density models, variational autoencoders. Uh, the variational lower bound, and then we covered implicit density models like the GAN. Other models that have not been covered uh, are not particularly popular or very used, so uh, that's the reason we focused on the more popular ones. And um, if you have, if you're, if you're going to train density models, uh, and you're figuring out which density model you should be using, uh, here are some pointers. So if you only care about the density estimates, just go for autoregressive models. You don't worry about sampling time here. If you care a lot about sampling time, then autoregressive may still be fine if your sequences are not that big, or if you use lightweight models. Uh, but if you really cannot afford to wait for 
the sampling time, if you really want really fast samples, but you still want to go for density modeling, you could think about using weak autoregressive models like parallel pixel CNN. Uh, and you could also think of doing latent space modeling, uh, like, like latent space, um, or like a weak UBAE. You may, you may probably not even need a quantization bottleneck. It could still work with uh, lay, uh, continuous values. And flow models are also uh, pretty appealing for modeling continuous value data, the density estimates for continuous value data, especially when, when they're actually continuous and it's, it's, it's hard to figure out how to even quantize them. So, uh, so that, 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 that's, that's, that's another uh, interesting um, aspect of flow models. And uh, if you also wanna think about um, how, how to have like representations and also sampling, but you wanna have the simplest possible model, uh, VAEs with factorized decoders, maybe the natural jaws. So given, given these appealing properties of density models, like when would you use GANs? Uh, you would use GANs when you really care about having good samples and you have really, really large images, high quality images, uh, photo, and you want something photorealistic. Uh, you have a lot of conditioning information like poles or the class or uh, edge, edge maps and you just wanna add texture to them. GANs are really good in these image to image translation problems or video to video. And uh, if all you care about is perceptual quality and controllable generation uh, and, and you don't have a lot of compute, uh, this is often the case for any any kind of startup. GAN is like the best choice to go for. So that's it for generative models. Uh, next, let's look at self-supervised representation learning, which is our final topic. So self-supervised image classification has seen rapid advance in the last one and a half years. Uh, just the end of 2018, the top one accuracy of ImageNet linear classification benchmark was 48%, and now it's 76.5%. So this rapid advance has been made in multiple labs uh, because of this mode of learning called contrastive learning. And the contrastive learning task can be simply summarized as a dictionary lookup task. And there are two ways to do this pretext text contrastive uh, learning, which is you either build it as a predictive coding task or you build it as an instance discrimination task. And in predictive coding, you have multiple mechanisms to do that. One is you either use the end-to-end -end mechanism or you use the momentum decoder, uh, mo momentum encoder, using the uh, momentum encoder for the keys. And uh, the predictive coding success story has been achieved in the contrast of predictive coding of CPC, uh, particularly the CPC version two, uh, and, 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 and the uh, instance discrimination success uh, has been achieved in MoCo and SimClear. Uh, MoCo means momentum contrast, and SimClear is end-to-end -end instance contrast. And they use the corresponding mechanisms of contrast learning. So let's look at CPC version two, MoCo and SimClear, in terms of their positives and the negatives. Uh, so CPC version two, you're doing spatial contrastive prediction. So that principle is very generic, and it can apply to any modality or domain. So you don't need to know the underlying data augmentation invariances. It can just work and it can be considered as a latent space generative model. And also it's much easier to adopt for audio, video, and text and perform multimodal training. Disadvantage is this, it splits your raw input into a lot of patches or frames or even audio chunks. And therefore your inputs are now, your inputs are now basically uh, split into a lot of different parts that you have to carefully delineate and you also need to carefully pick what part are you predicting from what. So that involves a lot of design choices to make hyperparameters that you can only know by trial and error. So that makes it really hard for you to use it on a, a domain or a task that you don't really understand well. And then you require multiple forward passes for these smaller versions of the inputs now. And so that means that you'll be pre-training on something much smaller or potentially fine tuning on much larger versions of the sequences or images. So this may not be an optimal thing to do. Uh, when you're doing local predictions, local spatial predictions, batch norm is hard to use. So applying batch norm is hard, but then you really want to use batch norm for a downstream task. So that makes CPC version two a little flawed in the sense it's not particularly suitable for downstream tasks. If you really care about state-of-the-art performance, and finally, 
the split in process mechanism is very slow on a on a on a on a matrix multiplication specialized hardware like TPUs. So it's because you do a lot of reshapes and transposes, and so uh, it's never an optimal thing to do. So here is uh, the summary of Moco. Uh, one of the main advantages of Moco is it is very minimal, so it's very easy to use and replicate. And it has no architectural change, can be easily applied for a downstream task. There is no notion of a patch. And it's distilling invariances for images using data augmentations. And so the pre-training procedure looks very much like supervised learning and therefore uh, it, it can get comparable or even better results. Uh, and the momentum encoder and memory bank mechanism adds a lot of stability to the training and decouples the batch size from the number of negatives. And therefore this lets you train with way fewer GPUs than what's needed for CPC or like other methods. The disadvantage of MoCo is that you, because you introduce a momentum update, you need to figure out what's the right decay rate for that. And that has an extra hyperparameter. And another disadvantage is in image augmentation invariances may not be applicable to other modalities. So this may be a method that just works only for visual image recognition. And finally, uh, well, uh, let's look at Simplier, which can be considered as an end-to-end -end version of the MoCo, uh, where you, you're just look, you're using all the negatives from your batch and there's no momentum encoder. So advantages of Simplier are the same as that of MoCo with the additional advantage that you don't have a momentum encoder now. So it's just gonna be as minimal as supervised learning. Uh, but the disadvantage is now you just need really large batch sizes because you need a lot of negatives because MoCo decouples the negatives from your batch size, it doesn't need as much compute as SimClear does. And similar to MoCo, data augmentation invariance may be very specific to image recognition. So in terms of future work left for self-supervision, uh, the gap between self-supervised learning and supervised learning is still not close if you consider just the same amount of compute, training time, and the same kind of data augmentations used. So, uh, and also fine tuning to downstream tasks, the gains are not significantly high enough that the paradigm shift has been made in vision. So that way, maybe new objectives are also needed. And uh, finally, all these uh, self-supervised uh, successes have relied on using ImageNet. And it's not clear if self-supervised learning would just work from images in the wild or from the internet. Uh, which is really the dream, and uh, which is really why people want to do self-support learning. So that's it for like uh, self-support learning as uh, in in terms of utility for downstream tasks. Uh, let's look at self-support learning in the context of uh, intelligence, like being able to act in an environment. So here is a video of this Quake Three game where you're like you can see some characters, and then you you can see some bullets. Uh, that, that, that are going to be uh, uh, fired and uh, you know you, you, you see all these different walls and fires and other characters and when you're looking at all this you're able to already uh, accurately parse the scene make sense of what's going on and uh, you're also able to uh, clearly separate out the objects from what's not objects and 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 so we need to be able to do that as well. We shouldn't be working at the level of pixels. We should be able to predict the future in a much more semantic latent space. And so modeling the pixel space for these high dimensional videos is really hard. And in order to build really intelligent agents we sh that, that, that can plan in faster than real time, we should be able to do it in the latent space that's more abstract. So how do we do that? What is the right kind of abstraction to build? And how do we learn role models in that latent space that can just ignore noise and work in a much more semantic space is really the hardest question to think about. And uh, this has also been summarized multiple times by Jan LeCun that uh, if, if you have a very good internal world model, you'll be able to plan with it and avoid a lot of mistakes that an RL agent usually makes. And uh, and how to do that is one of the most important questions. So if you want to have the overall view of self supervised learning across all these different problems, for image recognition, we saw a lot of successes uh, like CPC, MoCo, SimClear, MoCo version 2. Uh, 
uh, transfer learning. It works really well in language, uh, but the exact details will be covered in a future lecture. And transfer learning and vision also works reasonably well now, uh, being shown in CPC and MOCO. Uh, but there's like close to nothing in terms of how to use self-supervised learning for RL. Uh, so that's a very ripe area for future work. And then as far as like, you know, using self-supervision in the context of general intelligence is concerned, uh, it's, it's potentially going to be extremely useful in the context of transfer learning and learning useful abstractions for planning or imaginations. So uh, there's, there's still a lot of work to be done there. So that's, that's, that's it for uh, the summary of the class, uh, which pretty much ends with our original motivation, which is how do we build this uh, intelligence cake. Uh, and, 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 and a lot of it is going to be done through self-supervised learning. Uh, and, and so in terms of future lectures, you're going to look at uh, more applied topics, which are not falling into the main, uh, main, main lecture stream, which is like we'll be looking at semi-supervised learning. We'll also be looking at the whole area of unsupervised learning for language, which is language models and BERT. And then uh, finally, we look at how representation learning or self-supervised learning has been applied in the context of reinforcement learning. So, uh, and, and we, we've also covered things like how to do unsupervised distribution alignment that is given completely two different data sets with a lot of common information. How do we align the two manifolds together in a, without any prior data? And we'll see how generative models and unsupervised learning can be used in the context of building compression algorithms. So that's the, the next, next series of lectures will be uh, not particularly connected to the main topics, but the, mostly looking at how we can apply them for all these other various problems.